It's today, and I'm John Atak, and this is my dear friend and colleague, Joe Zimhart. Hi, Joe. Hey, John. Good to meet you in the here and now. Yes, the here and now. We are being uh -huh. here now, and, and that's the beginning of our topic for today, that right. um, we're not going to make you read Richard Alpert or Barbara Ram Das, as he later became known. Um, his book was called Be Here Now. It, it's a very essential concept that we're seeing repeated in mindfulness, this idea that if, if you can be totally in the present, absolutely in the present, then you'll be fine. Now, I was sold this in Scientology as being in present time. And mm -hmm. um, Scientology concept is a little bit different because where Hubbard is coming from is the idea that we're all hypnotically trapped in the trauma of the past and that to be to come up to present time is a standard hypnotic idea. If you've age regressed a client, you want them to come up to present time and be in the present again. And originally he didn't mean by that what Barbara Ramdas means by it. And I would suggest that it is a good idea to be present. It is a good idea to be perceiving what's happening around us. Very good idea. And it can be a joyful and wonderful thing to do if you're looking at a great piece of art or, or listening to wonderful music. Mm -hmm. But we also need to have our memories. We also need um, to be able to calculate and think about things. You know, Hubbard got it to this point where he said that looking was a much higher state than thinking. But I happen okay. to think thinking can be very good. I've looked at it and I think that thinking can be very good indeed. So there you go. That's opened it up. Um, let, right, so so let me uh, pause. When, when you put something on pause, does that mean you're in the here and now? Not anymore. Uh, <laughs> pausing, you know, because you, you pause to smell the roses. You're in the present, right? Um, so pausing. But but I think when when I'm hearing Eckhart Tolle, and we batted him around a bit before, <laughs> but but Baba Ram Dass and others who talk about the now. <laughs> They're not just talking about the pause to smell the roses. Mm. They're talking about the eternal presence of being, which doesn't have time and space, which mm. doesn't have past and future, which is always the same, which is always resolved, which is always enlightened, which is, you know, that's where they're going with this. It's not just a simple mindfulness uh, mm. uh, maneuver to dissociate the brain from its chatter and uh, relate to the garden or relate to the task at hand or breathe during a yoga session or whatever it is, you know, that it's, it's, it's a lot more invested with transcendental meaning mm. and religious meaning when they use the word now. Uh, Hubbard, of course, I think, uh, uh, tried to jam all that together in some sort of a quasi Buddhist uh, thing he had in his head, but, but but basically, I guess he used it as bait, like you could achieve this state if you followed his patterns of thought and his trainings and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, I, this is just how I saw him. He was quite clever. He understood what good bait was in order to get people caught in the trap. And mm -hmm. and and I, I think it was quite cynical that way. I think you it's know, absolutely he knew money, cynical. And and I he think knew money was going to come was going to come in. Yeah, and the. There's a fundamental idea in Scientology, and that is tell the suckers what they want to hear. So you say mm. you are an all powerful God and I can return to you your supernatural powers. Then, you know, some people are going to be, you know, interested by that. I mean, of course, Scientology will recruit you in any way. It's your business. It's your marriage. It's your health It's whatever. They'll go after what is of concern yeah. to you. But it always leads to this. We're going to make you an immortal being. And you're already an immortal being. And Hubbard did joke about that in some places and say, you know, I'm selling you something you already have, kind of selling mm -hmm. water by the river. But there's this idea of whatever it is you want, we can give it to you. And, and after you've spent all of your money and ended up broke and, you know, with your marriage in ruins and your children not talking to you, then you've graduated. <laughs> you know, you've, you've <laughs> become the nothing that Hubbard of course, tells you you are from the very beginning. Life is yeah. basically a static with neither mass, meaning nor motion. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I, I, 
as you say, quasi-Buddhist, that, that there's no way that Hubbard studied anything in Buddhism. There, there is mm. absolutely no, um, he, he, he doesn't ref, reflect on any of the, the sutras at all, or, or yeah. even the noble truths, or even, he did not understand Buddhism. The only thing he has is the universe is an illusion generated by those living in it. And of course, the Buddha went a step further and said, there's nobody living, living in it. You know? like, right, right, right. Well, there's no self. Yeah, you could say Buddha went all the way. He certainly you know, did, yeah. And he and he got stuck there in some sense. Uh, hmm. But but he had to backtrack like any decent teacher does and give some people an ethical ground yeah. on how to behave, you yeah. know, which is useful. And, and it wasn't as if he invented the whole thing himself. And having passionate uh, feelings or behavior toward all sentient beings is not a new idea in his day uh, and, but he he did he did um, expand on that and he's coming very much from the forest sages and and the upanishads yeah. are the are the that's what will lead you to to buddhism and the idea of the great self or the buddha mind or what have you but yeah and i mean i found buddhism incredibly coherent for about 40 years there you and, go um, then about 10 years ago bit more maybe it all just fell apart on me when I poked it <laughs> and I must say I'm a happier man knowing that the world is not you know the universe is not all suffering that there is some good times as well that's that's quite yeah good. oh good okay wonderful yeah <laughs> yeah so so I think that's what um I don't know what else we have to say about that uh the, you know the the the, the, the you know, making up these these religions, they're all flawed in a way, and new religions are maybe more so because they haven't worked out their kinks, and because of the narcissistic load that many new religious leaders have, they refuse to be corrected. Yeah. As a result, the religions don't grow; they stay quite frozen. Which Scientology has become frozen. It yeah, doesn't and, grow. And it's, it's, it's stuck with the text, you know, and. Yeah. Uh, Whatever he wrote, that's that's God's word, and now they're stuck with it. They they mm -hmm. can't really change much. Yeah, There's if you no start, committee start to... with just ten commandments, you can go quite a long way. But if you start with a couple of million words, it's really yeah. difficult to, yeah, and, yeah, and you that... know, like like the, the the Christian Church had councils and adjustments, and you know, mm -hmm. argued things. You know, they still do, and and democratic governments certainly do. They have amendments to constitutions mm -hmm. and, and constantly shifting you know, the needs of, of the times to to what the government can handle. And uh, but but when you get a static religion that has been frozen and even sealed up in large caves huh, on these plates like Scientology, mm. uh, it, it just isn't going in. There. It's stuck. You know, unfortunately, it's a dead religion in some ways. Yeah. And, and you've also got the, the, you know, this terrible thing that there's um a policy by by Hubbard where he says you can't say you can't say that anything is is old technology it's all still valid you can't say that because something is more recent it's more valid and so you're stuck with all of these this quagmire of contradictions where Hubbard is saying one thing and then saying the opposite and they're both true and in the middle of that you've got this concept that by doing exactly what you are told you'll become self-determined yeah and that's the fundamental double bind of scientology that you've got to agree with hubbard if you're going to think for yourself <laughs> and uh, that wouldn't you know, it's work for me. It, it's interesting that concept goes way back to the to the uh, earliest uh vedas the rig veda where the idea of karma got introduced you know a little later but but karma was basically uh, the idea that I have a book on karma. It's a thin book, but it, but it basically was uh, instituted to indicate that if you do the ritual exactly, you will not create karma. You know, so when you do the Agni Hotra to the more rising sun, mm -hmm. you do it precisely, like the tea ceremony. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do it precisely, you you don't create karma it's just like if you do your duty precisely in life if you know what that is you don't create karma you don't mm. you know 
make action into more action, reaction. Vipaka. Um, yeah. So, so the, um, you know, with that said, you can pervert that idea and create a highly disciplined religion, which says if you do this all day long, you know, pray six times a day, wear a certain type of clothing, use certain types of language, breathe a certain way, you will come closer to being with God or, or God. Mm. And, um, you know, that rigidity is a substitute for perfection. Yeah. And, and yeah. it enters in processes which have neurophysiological effects. No matter what you do, if you sit and stare at things, if you rock backwards and forwards, if you dance, if you drum, if you recite mantras, you'll create a brain state. And you can, as you well know, you can see this in just about every religion that they're using something that they're claiming is transcendent, that is give, giving them contact with divinity or you know, with Buddha mind which is in fact a physiological process, you know, like not eating or not sleeping. They're things that will create vivid experiences. If you add on top of that temporal lobe epilepsy, then you've got quite a lot of the cult leaders and what happened to them because their experience can be very, very intense and yeah. really real as Yuval or puts it, you know, the, so somebody like Hubbard will, they'll have a period where they've absolutely understood everything, you know, kind of manic episode where they've understood everything in the universe and then they crash and the crash is kept private i've interviewed many people who spent time with hubbard when he was whinging and depressed over a period of decades uh, you know uh, different people mm -hmm. at different times because he was collapsed be because his grandiose narcissism had been you know penetrated and the idea that he was the supreme ruler of the universe which i think is the essential idea in Scientology that you're not told about, uh, you know, like Bhagwam, the Supreme God, or, or, or you know, uh, Maharaji, or these people who make these grants, that he was really just on a, in his own terms, a roller coaster, where he would go really up and then really down and really up and really down. And he's pulling people into imitating his behavior in the idea that they will somehow transcend. And in fact, yeah. What they'll get is they'll feel high, they'll feel euphoria. It yeah. won't make them better in their family or business dealings generally, or, or nicer people, which I think. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that that mood um, shifting in someone like Hubbard uh, comes from the fact that he he couldn't do what what you examine, for instance, in, in, in psychiatric intake forms. Mm. It's called reality testing. Mm. You know, if the patient isn't good at reality testing, they a lot of their life begins to fall apart and someone like hubbard was never quite good at that you know he never even could assess his own reality in the world mm. he had to create this grandiose self because he was so insecure mm. and um Absolutely. You know, so he made up he made up stuff and, and so as a result he was in, unable to test reality with mm. himself in it uh his entire life yeah, I, I mean, I can and take that, that. That in itself can lead to a lot of mood distortion. Yeah, I, I can take that back to his teens on his um, little holidays in China, which in his imagination became studying with mystics. Yeah. Um, we have two handwritten diaries from the two trips. And one of the diaries, and these were put into evidence by Scientology to prove that he'd studied in China. And they just proved that he had two holidays with his parents. Um, yeah. The only mention of anything religious is him visiting a, a lamasery and saying the monks had voices like bullfrogs. There's no other mention of mystics, gurus or anything like that. But what fascinated me when I first saw these things, which is a long time ago now, was that there's a retype of one of them. So he's oh. got a handwritten journal, what he's doing day by day, and then he retypes it. And he's about 16 and he's improving everything in it. Okay. And in the same way that when he told stories, it was like, you know, in 1950, he's saying, well, I didn't see combat and uh, I got conjunctivitis, my eyes, and, and I hurt myself falling down a ship's ladder. Within a few years, he's claiming um, by the late 50s that he was crippled and blinded at the end of World War II and cured oh. himself with, you know. So I think what you say is very true, that, that he couldn't test reality properly. He felt inadequate, I think, because 
to some extent because his he lived in a household with his mum and his aunts, mm. um, the youngest of whom was only eight years older than him, and his granddad, Lafayette Waterbury, who was a vet and owned uh, a quarter, you know, half section of land, you know, a hundred and whatever acres, which by the time Hubbard is boasting about it is one quarter of Montana. So uh. everything, and I think it's partly because I think his grandfather was a good man. And I think his aunts were, were nice people, as far as I can tell it. And he was the only child in the household and he was treated as a little hero. And I think the expectation. Uh, the, 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 the proverbial spoiled brat. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, there's, there's even, there's a scene from his childhood where um, his mum, because he's said a naughty word, washes his mouth out with soap. Oh, and when, and when her sisters find this out, they grab her and in front of him, wash her mouth out with soap. Oh. So he is a little prince, you know, he, he grows up believing he's these things. And then he gets to the real world and fails, he fails at everything he does and then makes a story about how he succeeded. You know, so he is thrown out of George Washington University because um, of, you know, he's very poor study. And we have his grade sheets and we have him himself in a lecture called Introduction to Dianetics on the 24th September, 1950, where he says he failed the course in atomic and molecular physics. And yet, by the late 50s, he's claiming to be a nuclear physicist who studied mathematics as well at George Washington University. Mm. So th there is an essential thing to this, which, which, which is that Scientology only has one aim. And that aim is to get you out of your head, to get you out of your mind. And usually when I say this, people don't smile. And I'm kind of, you know, he wants to get you out of your head, yeah. <laughs> get you out of your mind. And you're to be three feet back of your head. And this is the constant in Scientology that the ultimate state that you will achieve, and it was first promised in 1952 and never achieved, is that you will be able at will to move out of your body and be anywhere in the universe you want to be. So. Uh -huh. Kind of astral projection or whatever we want to call it. I mean, that's that's a part of the Sant Mat uh, cults uh, thing is that you could soul travel. Mm. You know, uh, uh, Ekankar was an offshoot of that, and soul travel was a big thing in Ekankar. You know, you're reminding oh, me well, of the teaching. Paul Twitchell yeah. used to write material for Hubbard before he. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had Scientology there. roots at one time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then he got into the guru game in Sant Mat mm. and became one himself. Yeah, and a, a pretty dreadful one at that. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, so but, we have this, as you say, that there's depersonalization, derealization in psychiatry, people who aren't really quite sure where they are, depersonalization, or, mm -hmm. you know, don't see the world as it is, derealization. And I think Hubbard, when you add to that his own admissions about the amount of amphetamines, barbiturates and things that he took, um, certainly through the 1940s, you know, he talks about having been addicted to barbiturates, said he made himself a guinea pig in one of these experiments. I wrote a yeah. paper called uh, Never Believe a Hypnotist, which is his own statement, which gets into the detail of where he says those things about his drug use. So he was, yeah, he, he was somebody who created a false personality. And you know, it's and interesting, that. You, you, you said about him you know, somehow getting you to be three feet behind your head or out of your body in a way. Um, the reality in the, in the theosophical group I was with, uh, Church Universal and Triumphant, they had this thing called the chart or the magic presence. And, and in it, there's the human in what's called the four lower bodies standing on earth and, and, and this violet flame surrounding them. Above, there's a figure above them that looks like a Christ. It's called the Christ self floating about 10 feet up. And above that is this rainbow rayed being, the monad, which is the, the magic presence or, or the divine self. And uh, the idea was to merge with the Christ self, which is out of your body, and uh, hovering literally above you. You know, it's, it's like a, an invisible flowering of the self. And um, I guess in a way like the thousand petal lotus, you know, the, the idea out of yoga. So, so the, the entire teaching is similar to Scientology in that sense. It gets you to dissociate from 
this corrupt four lower bodies is you're constantly purging and and cleansing, especially through invoking the violet flame energy um, and uh, and becoming the Christ self, which is not in your body. It's above it toward the divine body. You know, so <laughs> you're visualizing this all the time. And, and, you know, after a while, you're not what you're not walking around in your body. Yeah. You, you know, in, in the group, you are now kind of uh, observing yourself from above, so to speak. Mm. And, and dissociated fundamentally. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I've seen people get really bad in, in the mm. group that were like that. You could see that they had that, what they called, you know, all the 10,000 mile stare where the lights are on, but nobody's in the house. Mm. And uh, yeah. Which yeah, we hear about people like that. Yeah, we, we hear about it, you know, throughout history that, that um, you know, I got very interested in Sufi teachings you know, from the outside, I must say. Um, about 20 years ago and I, I read a great deal and became really quite fascinated in this form of mysticism that was being practiced and of course it created some of the greatest poetry in the world the oh, poetry yeah. of Rumi and Hafez for example but but there are a lot of others and I then encountered this this thing this idea that you could achieve this bliss state where you would dissociate from reality and one of the descriptions that brought me up short was this guy who 40 years on woke up from this state and had no recollection of the last 40 years of his life because he'd been in this bliss state. And mm -hmm. that was sort of, yeah, this could be quite dangerous. You know, the lot of, you know, you know, talking to people who've done transcendental meditation and who've abandoned their kids and their, their work and everything so that they can be in this right. kind of bliss state which is not really very blissful as far as i can tell it's more kind of uh no it's, it's kind of a numbing you know it's kind of a numbing non-reactive state you know mm -hmm. if you really get into it so to speak or, or achieve it for long periods of time I, this last video i did on ramana maharshi Meher baba and uh, uh paul brunton um, ah. regarding these mystical states because brunton you know was a critic of was a follower of both of these types of teachings but also a critic you know mm -hmm. he he kind of separated the doctrine from the man and he saw the, the the ashrams as being quite flawed now brunton himself was was deluded he he in the end he had his own following and lived with uh uh jeffrey masson's, jeffrey masson's dad masson yeah. grew up with brunton in his household my father's and guru by masson is, is a father's wonderful guru. Yeah, yeah correct i use it in the video mm -hmm. uh but but the the important uh point here is that um, this state that Meher Baba, Ramana Maharshi achieved, and they first got to it in their teens after having an existential crisis. Yeah. You know, uh, Ramana Maharshi had a crisis over dying. You know, what does death mean? And he went into deep depression. And, and then to resolve that, he did what gurus do. They dissociate and went into a bliss state, you know, felt better about things uh, and decided that was the state you had to be in all the time. So, you know, it, it, it didn't solve anything because his ashram had problems and he eventually had to do things like wash dishes and help organize things and, you know, all of that messy stuff that you can't remain in bliss at. Now, his disciples claimed he was in bliss, whether he was doing that or not. And even at the end of his life, when his arm had cancer and had to be amputated he was in suffering but he was still in bliss at that time dissociating from the pain mm. which you can do through auto hypnosis you know there's no big deal in other words is what i'm trying to point out and and what i did in the video was picked up this rock mm. and i said i submit that you know this stone is actually in a greater state of perfect bliss than any guru ever has been mm. and they'll never achieve what this rock is achieving right now which is pure being it's non-reactive and um you know it it, it just observes uh for instance one of the criticisms paul brunton had about uh, ramana maharshi was when in 1934 35 when they brought it up that the italians had uh, attacked ethiopia invaded it and killed you know slaughtered many many people maharshi's reaction was if you're enlightened you could observe five million people being uh killed and you'll stay in this state it doesn't move you in other words you have no 
ethical reaction. A bit like Heinrich Himmler, really, all of a sudden. Right, right. So who did believe in uh, similar things and practice both yoga and meditation. Yeah, the thing, the thing with this rock is it's so detached; it doesn't have to eat. Oh. It, it doesn't defecate like gurus do. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it, it doesn't have to breathe like hmm. gurus have to do. I mean, it's much more perfect hmm. when you think about it. So, but if, if it's your look, higher self, you better hope it doesn't fall on you because it might hurt. You know, yeah, it might hurt. Uh, but, but. But anyway, it's, um, I mean, you can even pulverize this rock and it won't feel a thing, you know? So which one is more enlightened? Which one is more perfect? You know, the guru or the stone? I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm mocking it, but at the same time, I'm just following the logic. But it could be a new, enlightenment game. a new life for pet rocks here. You know, they could be saint rocks that, that we can sell and yeah, finally yeah, make they, some they, money. They you know? accept anything you put on them. You can put on a tuxedo on a rock and it's yeah. fine. And, you know, it'll it'll go to a, a prom or a, a formal with you. And and it'll it has achieved happy. has achieved the highest state of Scientology, which is serenity of beingness. There you go. Yeah, it's I think I'll write it on the back of that rock. It's a serenity of beingness. That's it. You know, <laughs> this is what it looks like. Yeah. And you come into the world and, you know, for me, the whole, as I say, for about 40 years, I, I conceive myself to be a sort of a Buddhist. I only belonged to a Buddhist group for about a year, a Soto Zen group, when I was a teenager. I later came, now that was G.U. Kennett's group, the Mount Shasta group, which has Throstle Hole Priory in this country. And I came to a very thorough belief eventually as Buddhist ideas, you know, somehow I separated from those ideas. You know, having taught people about, you know, Scientology and new religious movements, cults, all this stuff for many years, I was not a practitioner of any ritual, of any ceremony. I meditated. Um, mm -hmm. My meditation had come away from the fixed staring at the wall meditation because that didn't feel very healthy to me. So I would listen what, to what music. Color, what color was the wall? Ah, uh, it was it every, matter. It was every color you like. I <laughs> see. <laughs> um, so you know, I wanted to turn the conversation around a bit because mm -hmm. we're, we're 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 deconstructing and. and pointing out the, the skepticism behind this, but but there's a reason why people are attracted to this stuff, the transcendental states and so forth. They, they have some value within limits, you know? So so my, my pet word for this is to not overvalue what is mm -hmm. valuable, you know? So, you know, like for instance, in Zen, you, you must have had some feeling of some value even on hindsight for even approaching it, even if it was just to learn something about Zen. You know, I, that, that... I, I think there's a complexity here. I absolutely agree with you that, that I would not dismiss meditation or, or mindfulness as potentially useful vehicles. They become dangerous if they take your life over. Um, Miguel Farias, who's at Oxford University, is the editor of the Oxford Handbook of Meditation and a mindfulness practitioner. In the book, The Buddha Pill, which ostensibly supports the practice of mindfulness, he points out, A, that there's no, at the point he's writing, no robust scientific evidence, and he's speaking from Oxford University, of workability in mindfulness. Um, but he also says that one of his friends pointed out to him that he'd become a mindfulness junkie. And he said, this is true. I became you know, obsessed with, with the practice of meditation. And yeah. that's the problem. It, it, absolutely, as you say, it's what portion of meditation. I still, you know, I can switch off the language in my head, you know, after 50 years of meditating, what have you, I can be in the, the stream of consciousness. There was tremendous value for me in, in my initial learning of meditation at Throstle Hole Priory when I was 18. It was brilliant. I'd gone there to be there for six months and I lasted three days and went, I'm going home. And uh -huh. I've never regretted that decision. Because seeing what becomes of the monks and yeah. their lives, um, it, it, it was not, it was, it was curious. I, I had a, what's called a mondo, a, a direct conversation with the abbot, uh, Daiji Strathern. And I'm sad to say that if you look to the website of Throstle Hole Priory, Daiji Strathern no longer exists uh -huh. because he defected to the Tibetans. They've written him out of the history of, of the priory, which uh -huh. is appalling. And he was, he was really interesting. He, he, you know, the half hour I spent with him was very useful indeed. He was a very bright man. But 
as we walked from the the dojo or zendo whatever over to um his office across the courtyard the monk who was accompanying me and this is the first year of it opening there were only five monks there and you know or four monks and a nun and this monk was walking alongside him so i've been here for five months and he hasn't talked to me yet and one wow. of the things he said to me was if you join a group be sure that the lowest person in it has something that you want and i just had something that told me you don't want this if if this is a place where this poor man has been here for five months and he's still consumed with this annoyance that yeah. he's not being properly regarded it hasn't done me good so i felt there was a kind of counterbalance that you can get something tremendously good from meditation for me it was seeing that there were levels of linguistic thought and i got down to four levels going on at the same time in my brain mm -hmm. and, and that was really useful to to go oh yeah there's all this stuff that's supposedly unconscious that i can be aware of it's just the speed of processing and so that was very useful on the other hand when you look at the traditional zen monastery the first thing i was told when i arrived was we don't use the zen stick i'd never heard wow. of the zen stick and then you find that in an ordinary monastery, yeah. they will whack you if you move while you're meditating and yeah. no not really that's not useful you know so there's a balance and, and and an important part of that balance is that you do the thinking rather than mm -hmm. somebody selling you a bill of goods about your transcendence or you know the charisma of the leader or what have you that that you're able to to assess your own emotional condition and and decide yeah i think you're bringing go. up a good point you know there's, there's this constant tension do you fit the system and does the system fit you um the law is made know, for the, man the, not man for the law i think Jesus. yeah there's a lot of one size fits all approaches yeah. in what we call cults you know and and if if it doesn't work for you there's something wrong with you is how, mm. how the narrative goes so uh rather than be a flexible approach to spirituality which you might have in the larger religions because you can you know you, you can become quite obsessed and, and participate seven days a week, or you can go once a year and they still consider you a member, hmm. you know? So you, at least you have a way of fitting in without having it straitjacket you yeah. into itself, you know, with the larger religions. And, uh, and maybe that's the benefit. It might be their weakness, but it's also a, a way they can benefit a, a wider range of people to be more accommodating, um, you know, even bringing handicapped in, for instance, uh, as long as they're not disruptive to the congregation, uh, you know, like babies, they have a baby cry room, you know, with glass over it because they are handicapped. Babies are handicapped with their mm. brain size and, and their inability to reality test and whatever. And they cry when they're upset, you know, and uh, so, but, but in the same way, you know, you don't want to bring in somebody that's manic and, and challenging the priest in the middle of the uh, service or the rabbi. but you can, you know, I used to bring in, for instance, uh, I volunteered when I was uh, working at a large institution that had what we called retarded back then or brain damaged or mm. mentally deficient people that, that were under 70 IQ. And, and I would take four or five of these, maybe four of these young men to a synagogue once a week for services. And, you know, they put their yarmulkes on and, and they were behaviorally okay you know, from mm. the institution. And I would take them in and drop them off. And I didn't often sit for services because I wasn't Jewish. But an hour and a half later or so, I picked them up and drive them back to the institution. This is something I volunteered to do mm. uh, while I was a, an employee there for two years. And, uh, you know, so so all I'm pointing out here is that that reformed synagogue was quite flexible in its approach to these people that barely understood what was going on in the service but they felt good being there being part of it yeah you know uh so you know that kind of behavior you don't see in these more straight jacketed cults they no, reject it, people it, like that they wouldn't accept the them money. in there because they're not good deployable agents mm. you know they, they don't they don't that they're annoying is what it is to 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 the purists within the cult you know, it's very, spe very specific in Scientology. You don't recruit people who are disabled mm -hmm. and 
Uh, I didn't realize, you know, Hubbard keeps going, it's to make the able more able, Scientology. Yeah. And I was, yeah. uh, I was in waiting for a changing planes in Las Vegas a long time ago. And um, this guy came and talked to me. Um, you know, we'd arranged to meet. And he was extraordinarily annoyed about this idea in Scientology. And he really got it through to me. He was absolutely right that, that you know, Scientology was excluding people for the reason you say, if they haven't got money, if they can't go out and recruit people for you, then it's no good. Um, and different groups will have different approaches to that. Yeah, know? now, you know, the group I was with, Church Universal, their, their approach wasn't, this is typical of theosophical groups, I think, where there's an elitism about your karma and your readiness to be with the spiritual it. teacher. You know, so if you're ready, meaning you have enough money and time and, and you're not annoying, um, <laughs> then, <laughs> then they will accept you within the fold. Uh, now, I did notice... There was a, two people I know specifically that were mentally unstable, but they had an inheritance. And once they lost their inheritance to the group within about six to eight months, the group shunned them. And one of them had to sue to get the money back and eventually got some of it back. But but this was the behavior that, you know, well, they weren't ready for the spiritual teaching. They're not evolved enough. Uh, they have a lot of karma to overcome. Uh Maybe in five or ten lifetimes they can come and join a group like ours. You know that was the logic behind this mm -hmm. whole kind of hierarchical. Um, you know, you, you you have to be when you're ready, the Buddha will appear and all that kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, be the elite. And I, I'm I'm sure that you found it, but in my very brief career doing interventions in the early '90s, and in the you know with the 600 or so former members that I've I've talked with over the years about their recovery that it becomes very evident quite early on that that you want them to think for themselves you want them to be able to make decisions and that to the extent and 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 there is this sort of elitist belief that there are people who will never be able to think for themselves and we just have to you know their sheep to be sheepled and and looked after and shepherded and that that possibly is true but to the extent that you can allow somebody to make decisions for themselves then that's a good thing and mm -hmm. so where any religious or social political group is enforcing a teaching on people that is against their best interests and is is not helpful to them and that's a bad thing um, like the Zen stick, I think that's a bad thing personally. But that that it it's you know if if people are developing, if, you know if if their lives are getting better, if their ability to relate to the world and to other people is improving, then those are good things. And a good group, you'll see those things happening. It's 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 socially a positive force. Whereas in a you know an authoritarian cult, what what happens is that you are restricted, ever more restricted, and you are told that these people are your friends. But as soon as there's some little bit of paper that says that you're not with the group anymore, they're not your friends anymore. These right. are not real relationships that are being forged. They're devotional relationships, devotion to the guru, devotion to the teaching, or what is technically called a cult by definition, <laughs> which is, is probably not good for us. So probably not. Um, probably not. If too many people learn that lesson the hard way. Yes, and and if, I think if they do, I mean, I I learned it the hard way, but it took me a year and a half till I finally bailed, and then the struggle for many years of research and and adjustment to what the hell happened to me, and you know, so yeah, sometimes just that subconsciously having to face the recovery keeps people in groups for longer than they want to even though they want to leave yeah because they kind of instinctively know this is going to be rough if i get out of here i'm familiar here i know what i'm doing every day i just have to fake it you know for a while and when i'm ready i'll leave and i've known people that knew they were going to leave four or five years before they actually stepped out of the group it's, it's an amazing process but we don't like to to um go into that pain of cognitive dissonance 
-hmm. we avoid it, you know, and because uh, it is painful. It is. Um, and we, we tend to follow the tram lines that are laid down. We tend to be consistent yeah. with with our behavior, throw good money after bad. Um, and the group, of course, has ways of, of rousing aversion against the mm -hmm. other, the non-member um, of guilt in the member and of, of phobia in the member. So that they do it. Uh, when I talked with um, Robert Vaughan Young and his wife, Stacey Young, and I kind of exit counseled them they'd they'd left scientology's sea organization yeah i remember them well yeah. four years before and lovely people but vaughn called me up and uh you know i happened to be going out to la a couple of weeks after he called me so we met and they told me that for seven years they both wanted to leave but they didn't yeah. dare tell the other in case they were reported and that they'd be separated but they both comes to this decision. So the thought that their marriage was not as powerful as the relationship with the group. And when they talked about the horrors they went through, I mean, Stacey went through an ectopic pregnancy, um, wow. a pregnancy in her tubes. And when she finally got to a doctor, there was quite a lot of blood involved. And the doctor looked at her and said, you should have been dead a month ago. And she'd just been walking around on tiptoe doing David Miscavige's bidding because, you know, that's yeah. the environment you're in. You're a slave. You, you've, you've lost all autonomy with it within this, this situation, which is as bad as it gets, you know, um, but there are varying forms of slavery and along the way, I mean, returning to the, to the original thought, that where people are desperate to be in this moment, um, and desperation is not a good thing, your rock is serene. Your rock does not care. You know, yeah. this moment, next moment, couldn't care less. It's all the same to me. I've been around for hundreds of millions of years, seen it all, known it all. That that desperation, you know, a, a couple of years ago, a new scientist, there was a mindfulness meditator who wrote in, insisting that he was you know in the present moment and you're going well how did you call upon your vocabulary of words surely they're things you acquired in the past so what is our relationship is yes you want to as, as you said put down the the worries the anxieties of of daily life and be able to focus from time to time and sometimes you need to just take your head out of things and listen to some music or look at some beautiful art or stare at the wall if that's what suits you though you will get the Gansfeld effect if you do and start hallucinating but there that's you know as you said it can be overvalued and it can be overused yeah. and it can take up too much of your time if you're not actually doing something in the world so almost like the argument between works and grace that, that mm -hmm. when the um Protestant movement under Zwingli, who's never mentioned, and Luther, who's always mentioned, comes along. There is this rather idea that it's all predetermined, and it doesn't matter what you do, your good works, it's not going to make any difference. I do not like that idea. I, I think mm -hmm. that how social we are, how much we contribute to society is our social worth. It's our worth to other, it seems rather easy. Yeah, you know, it, it really comes down to, I think, um... Uh, Becker said it in, in his book about death that, that he hoped that after all his explorations in philosophy and psychology that what really it comes down to is that you do your best to leave a decent legacy, hmm. you know, and that's what speaks for you. Um, you know, hopefully people aren't lying about you and your legacy <laughs> in the future, but uh, but you can't control that. You know, do you when you were talking about this whole thing in the beginning about the now, like like that that uh, book, A Course in Miracles, is based on this concept that there's this holy instant, in other words, the eternal now, mm -hmm. which we are always in. We can't not be there, and uh, it's only our mind that attacks it all the time. And that we have to find these ways, strategies of. Of, of shutting that down. And of course the book has 365 meditations that you could do every day and ad infinitum until you pass away. Um, what's missing in this whole concoction that came through Helen Shookman's 
uh, rather rather disturbed, anxious brain, you know, called the voice for seven years. She struggled with this um, and, and wasn't even punctuating as she was writing. She just kept automatically pouring out these ideas. Um, is, is, is she in, missed the point of the message that she was giving herself entirely is if she understood it, she wouldn't have written a word. Yeah. And she would have dropped the whole idea, not muddled with this, you know, hijacking Jesus in order to make her work more important, and uh, just tried to become a better mental health therapist where she was working. And, and that would have been it, you know. But she never got the point that her own mind was telling her through this elaborate conversation she had for seven years. She missed it. She totally missed it. And she was anxious about it even toward the end of her life. She never quite, she admitted she never quite got the lessons, didn't see it, you know, what the voice was telling her. <laughs> and uh, neither did Thetford, her partner, that helped put that thing together uh, and, and believed in it. And others that later, you know, like Edgar Casey Foundation helped to bring together an edit editor uh, to edit that thing. Um, a Jewish man that was studying to be a priest and then decided the Course in Miracles was it, and he became the editor of it. Uh, and, and it's in, because of him, it's in its present form. But uh, so all I'm pointing out here is that it, it is shockingly ridiculous that that she, and, and, and it's, it's, it's almost a shame that she couldn't get her own message. Hmm. And and it should have you know maybe in a few days or a few months, but writing out that thing for seven years made a mess of the whole idea. Hmm. Really, it didn't clarify a thing. And um, you know when when it's really quite simple, you know you're just like this rock. You're in the here and now, okay, but act like a human. You're not a rock. Yeah, you know, that's really basically the message. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do to sell that to people. Eh? Yeah, I yeah, have to elaborate don't... on it a little bit, you know. But... Yeah, the rock psychology. Rock psychology. Go yeah. to rock concerts and all of that. Cool. Well, we didn't get. So to... I've, I've got to get going because I have to get yep. ready for another uh, session with a client. Uh, mm. uh, but it's been great. Uh, yeah. yeah Always we, is. we managed to avoid this book that I had brought up, so that's good. Yeah. We'll <laughs> I have maybe to revise to... my review. We'll, we'll yeah. maybe get to it next time um oh, sure so yeah thank you extraordinarily much um always yeah. always good fun always interesting and enlightening and yeah, um we will meet again relatively soon thanks so much joe good john thank you hi john here thanks for watching we'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.